What we're studying is now we're halfway into the book of Acts. We're looking at Paul's first missionary journey. Paul has been traveling now, and uh, I know they won't be able to see this on the TV screen, but he has left an area of Antioch, sailed over to the Isle Island down here of Cyprus, traveled across, went up into Perga, over to Poseidon, Antioch. There he moves on over to Iconium, down to Lystra, and we're going to head over to Derby tonight. You know, no, not that kind of Derby, but we're going to the Derby. Okay, so what happens is, is that Paul is singing that old Christopher Cross song, Say. He's not always making of just condemnation, negative. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him he rose up and came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And now look at this here in verse 19. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Uh, these opponents came to really just kick Paul's ministry off the charts. They didn't want anything. Uh, they didn't want him doing this at all. They've traveled about a hundred miles to do this. You got to think about how aggravated they were with Paul to not just run him out of town. No, no, no. That's not. That's not good enough. We're going to hound his ministry, and we're not going to be satisfied until his ministry is finished or he is dead trying. Well, they stone him. And as I shared with you, there was a couple means of stoning. A lot of times what they would do is they would take you to a cliff. If there was a cliff and push you off the cliff, and if the fall didn't get you, then they would take up great big rocks and chuck them down at you. Or they would just pick up stones and begin to throw them at you and hurl them at you. Now, pretty good form of execution. They go to do this here to Paul, and they, they stir up the people. This is a form of they wanted to see these guys executed for preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wow, what a, what a loving group of people. Wouldn't you want to be a part of a religion like that? Wouldn't you want to be a part of somebody who says, hey, we, if you don't love us, we'll kill you. You know, no, that's so wrong. They, they tried to stir up and persuade the people and attempt to execute Paul and Barnabas. Now, this is, this is a dramatic demonstration of how fickle the crowd is. Because if you remember the crowd just earlier, they were like, you all are gods, little g. You must be Zeus and Hermes. Oh, wow. We love you. We love you. We love you. Oh, here, put on the lays around the neck like you entered on the Hawaii. And, oh, come on in. Let us worship you. Let us adore you. And then they turned on them just as fast. How can they be so fickle? Well, relationships are often like that. I love you. And they say, I don't love you. I want to get married. I don't want to get married. Well, then let's just call the whole thing off. I mean, it's that quick. How do you go from wanting that kind of a relationship to saying that they're gods to literally wanting to kill them? It's, it's, it's a flip of a switch night and day. And in fact, it's overwhelming. They take Paul. I don't know how they didn't get a hold of Barnabas. I still have not figured that out. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess he's faster than Paul. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but he, they got a hold of Paul. And man, did they ever put a beating on him and stoned him. In fact, to the place and point, you would have thought that he was dead. Now, I shared with you who wrote the book of Acts is none other than Dr. Luke. I like the fact that he presents it from a medical profession aspect that they had presumed him to be dead. That's pretty powerful. I mean, they had given up and saying, this guy's dead. When you look at the wounds, when you see him, 
I mean, go up, what'd they do? Did they take his pulse? Did they check on him? They just assumed him to be dead, or maybe he was just beaten and bloodied. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've ever been hit by a rock. Um, I can't imagine being hit by large rocks and stones. I mean, it, it's, it's overwhelming. But Paul, they left him for dead. Now, why do I keep stressing that? Because I like the fact of what the Word of God says more so than what just all commentators say. And a lot of times people will take other passages of Scripture, which is the best commentator of all, but they try to make them fit in passages of Scripture like this. For example, Paul later wrote, he said, I, I, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Now, when we think of the marks of Jesus, I think of the marks of Jesus in the palms or the, in, the, in the wrist area here and in the feet and the piercing of the side. I think of that, but sometimes we have scars in ministry that you can't see on the outside, but they've scarred us. Some things have hurt us very deep. There's ministry, and it hurts. And there's the scarring of ministry and the works of which we have done for Jesus. Galatians six seventeen, he talks about that, that I bear those in my body. I believe Paul had some physical scars, though, as well, to say, yeah, I got this one when I was witnessing for him over here. And, well, I got this one over here whenever I was testifying and I was trying to tell him about Jesus. And I got this wound over here. And, I, I, yeah, I got this one here when I tried to tell a man I was about to lead him to the Lord and somebody came up and got me from behind. You know, he has the scars to show. He, he certainly later referred to the stoning in 2 Corinthians 11.25. And it's been suggested, keep this in mind, it's been suggested that he had his heavenly vision at this time in 2 Corinthians 12. Whether I was in the body or I was out of the body, I, I don't know. I, I believe that Paul actually had that experience, but to try to make it fit here at a point whenever he was beaten half to death, or some want to say that he was beaten to death and come back. It's speculation. Let's not make it say something that it doesn't say. He was, he was borderline gone, but God did not see fit to take him yet. But it is, in, uh, it is for sure a thing that it had to come to his mind at the time frame of whenever he was being stoned himself. It had to come back to his remembrance, that of the stoning of Stephen back in Acts chapter 7. And how he stood by and saw, and he knew what was going to happen. As soon as those stones started to come out, he knew it was going to be over for him. Well, they beat him half to death. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good indication that it's time to leave. If, some, if it's turned physical, it's time to move on. But what does Paul do? Well, in verse 20, we see here, after they had supposed him to be dead, he said, How be it as the disciples, again, Acts chapter 14, verse 20, Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. What city? The same city that just beat him half to death. That's pretty bold. In fact, I mean, you talk about um, tough guys. They're always wanting to make these action movies and more blood and more gore. Why don't they... Just tell the Bible, my goodness, it's rated R for read. And, and, and he goes back into the city. Can you imagine? He comes in, bandages on his head. He's all bloodied. He's all beaten up. And saying, Is that all you got? You know, I mean, I, I, I can't help but think about that. And he comes in and he, he's excited and, and he's, he's like, I'm not done yet. God's not finished with me. I still have a job to do. And he says, I'll leave on my terms and I'm, I'm not going. Until God's through with me. And you know when God was through with him there? The next day. <laughs> it was finished. But I love the fact that he went back in. And I'm going to share a little story with you. I know we're recording. But it's okay. Scars in ministry. I've shared with you a little bit about just my personal testimonies. You can't go wrong sharing your own testimony because it happened to me. And I know it to be true because I was there. But I never will forget young preacher come into a church. Some are going to figure out who this is, but that's all right. It's all right. Just going to share my testimony. Paul shares his. I'm going to share mine. Two years in, they say after you're a new preacher, about two years after that, honeymoon's over. 
That's the old story. Honeymoon's over. They love you and they like you until about two years in, and then you get something happen. I don't know what. Well, we had some things happen, and the short and long of it is, is we were spending some excessive monies in our Sunday school department and uh, addressed that, and we had, uh, I mean, it was about $3,000 more a year than what we was really spending. We had books piling up. Nothing was being used, and come that year, the church voted, and they voted in on a new Sunday school director. Well, the old Sunday school director didn't like that a whole lot. In fact, threatened to run over me. I promise. And was serious. Did not like it at all. Close friends that you can really trust. My grandpa was alive at that time. Frank had some other good confidants. Don't ask everybody because the more more people you ask, the more opinions you get. But I had about, keep it under five. If you're really going to ask those biblical mentors that speak into your life, and I I talked to about five of those, and one said, yeah, you're ministry, you're done, leave, it's over. Knowing the dramatics and the situations and the backdrop, your ministry here, you're finished, you better move on, you better start looking, it's over. Get out of town, get out of Dodge. And I had one guy come to, one, and the least influential of all. I mean, he really was, he was the least influential of all, but he knew the details and he knew the backdrop. And he came to me and he said, yeah, you can't go. I said, what? He said, you can't leave yet. I said, what are you talking about? I just, uh, I, I didn't tell him, I, you know, I'd done talk to a couple others here, but it's, it was at that place in point. He said, you can't go. He said, because, he said, if you leave now, you'll always leave. If you run away at this stage, you'll always find yourself running away. You got to stay. I'm like, dang, wow. And he was the least influential, but you know what? He was right. We stayed and we stuck and we moved on and, 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 and things progressed and there was great works that was able to be done. And I'm, and I'm thankful for that because sometimes we want to leave when we're wanting to leave, when it hurts, when it's pricking, when it's not fair and so forth. And that's not, that's not what God told us to do. It's when God tells you and you have to be sensitive to what God's saying. There has to be a push, but there also has to be a pull. And if you don't understand that, there has to be a pushing away, yes, but there has to be a pull to draw of something else. And, and that's very, very important to note. And it doesn't always happen overnight. Here what happens is, is that he wasn't finished yet. But I believe that through Paul's obedience, the next day he departed with Barnabas unto Derby. Now Derby's just a, uh, you know, a next town just on over here again, about, you know, about another 20 miles or so. And um, so they go to Derby. Now, Paul leaves, he leaves Lystria, he's entering in the city of Derby, and he finds more evangelistic success. And the next day as he departs there with Barney, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many. You know, you can't give up, and this is for all of us. Maybe you didn't see great success on this trip. Maybe you didn't see great success at that preaching event or that Sunday school lesson, and you'd love to have everybody everybody come forward and see great numbers of souls get saved maybe that's not always the case but you don't quit you just got to keep going and you got to keep going and you got to keep going I think about that of the relationship of a fisherman and man when I go fishing with Dustin he wears I don't know how he does it I'm using him as an illustration because it isn't just a I mean, as fast as he can go. And I'm like, my goodness, the fish can't catch the thing as fast as you're reeling. You're outrunning all of them. And it's, and I'm like, trying to tie my hook up <laughs> just where he caught that one. What if he just cast it and said, you know what, I didn't catch a thing. <sighs> Let's go home. You got a sandwiches? Get the crackers out. No, you're going to have to cast a whole lot more than you catch. Cast, 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 but don't quit. Does that make sense? They go on over to Derby. Maybe they didn't want to hear it there, but he went on to somewhere else where they were receptive and where they were able to listen and hear the word of God. So Paul and Barnabas goes in there, and they continue to do the work, and and it's wonderful preaching the gospel, and they're making disciples. What a beautiful, beautiful picture this is. It's, It's awesome. I can't say enough about it there again in verses 20 and 21. Howbeit as the disciples 
stood around about him, supposing he'd been dead, and howbeit as the disciples stood around him, he rose up and come into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. What? Hold on. Is 21, is this, does this verse even need to be in there? What in the world are they going to do? I, I don't, this is hard to fathom. You're saying, what are you talking about, Brother Jason? I want you to note that if you notice, they started in Antioch. Notice the red. The red line is the line that they sailed to take their trip and go that way. But do you see the blue line? Oh, man. Sorry. Do you see the blue line? This is the trip that they took back. Why would you not just go on around over here and go back home? They go back to the very churches that rejected or that perhaps they planted. They go back in reverse order. Pretty crazy, isn't it, to think about? They went back to the places to which they had been. That, to me, I just found it fascinating as returning on that trip and on that journey, confirming the soul's and exhorting, let me just read on. Verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into that probably a little bit more than some of y'all may, may really understand tonight. But they go backwards. Oh, than the ones that got away. My grandpa, I don't know how many churches he pastored. I think I may have shared with you my real dad was in eight different high schools. I mean, they pulled him. I mean, he went around like a like a military child. And my grandpa had a lot of different churches. And one of his goals was is to go back to all the churches that he had ever pastored, maybe just to stop in or to visit, see what was going on. You know, my hope and goal, and I hope that it would be yours too, is that I hope and pray that the church would excel and exceed and would build and grow and be more fervent and vibrant long after I'm gone than even while I was there. And you say, that doesn't make sense. No, it's not about you and I. It's about God and it's his church. And you want to see it flourish. I'd love to hear about the places that we'd been be triple, quadrupled in size and growing and in ministry. He always wanted to go back to all of the churches that he had pastored and just visited. Now, for granted, probably many of those would have never even recognized him. Many of those had probably even moved on or had not been there at all. Maybe some of them he'd had some trouble with, maybe even threatened to run over him. Who knows? But you have these encounters. And I thought about that. What if some of the older pastors was to come back here? What would they say about Oklahoma? What if some was able to travel and venture back through? If brother, uh, Well, I guess even going back, didn't Richard News dad, didn't he used to be here? Is that the case? What about Noel Dodson if he was able to come back and look? Brother Mitch, these are just a few that I know. Um, I think about what it would be like if they came back. Would they look and they say, that looks the same to me. It ain't changed a thing. you know?" Or, or would they say, hey, they've done a few things and it really looks nice. It looks neat. Hey. Seeing the souls that are saved, how many people's coming to know the Lord, seeing the adventures, seeing, hearing the stories. It, it'd be neat to go back and see what growth has come forth from the seeds that you have sown. Many Christians need confirming and they need strengthening in their souls. And many need exhorting to continue in the faith. It's no small thing to walk with the Lord year after year, trial after trial. And it takes a strong soul to be encouraged. And some call this kind of mindset and I know that you've heard the term especially they say if you're going to go into ministry at all you've got to be thick what thick skin why is that I don't want to be thick skin how you be thick skinned and tender hearted but if you don't you're going to have more scar tissue than you do skin tissue I can only imagine even having brother Stanley here with us tonight you've Six churches, is that correct? You've been in six churches? I want to say. I 
seven counting here, right? Well, I don't know if you counted it the first time. But anyway, six, you've been director of missions, you've done things. And I'm sure that, not to single you out like I did uh, Brother Martin last week, but I'm sure you can look back and wouldn't it be something to go back and just see the, and your hope and prayer would be that those churches would be, I know it is, your heart would be that those churches would be better today than they were years ago. That's not always the case in some scenarios. But moving on, they seen the need to go back and preach the message. Now, Paul could preach the message because he had lived the message. Paul could preach the message because he lived the message. Susan and I, we've talked about this several times. We ought to write a book about our ministry. But it would be put in fiction category because nobody would believe it. Some of the things that you encounter, some of the stories that you hear, some of the stuff. I mean, it's just, it's, it's beyond measure, some of the things that you encounter. This, for many, is a forgotten message today. They consider any kind of tribulation. I want you to note this because you say, man, you talk about the ministry like it's hard or like you wish you wasn't in it. Absolutely not. I can't see myself doing anything but this. But it is difficult. And anybody that says, just like this morning, I preached on temptation, but there's difficulties that we encounter in life. Look again here, and I'm afraid that we as Christians, we think that we should never be tempted and that becoming a Christian is the easy way out and the easy lifestyle. My friends, that's not the case. Look at verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Well, I have faith. What means i got to continue in the faith? Didn't I have faith once and I'm done? No. You continue in the faith. How often? Daily. Daily continue in the faith. Father, forgive us of our sins as we forgive our debtors. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, lead us not into what? Whoa, wait a minute. I have faith. Who's, how am I going to be tempted? No. I told you it's still carrying over from this morning's message of temptation. Temptation is still out there long after salvation. Temptation is still there. And look at this. Continue in the faith. And that we, who's we? That's you, that's I, all of us. We must through much tribulation. Much tribulation. Enter into the kingdom of God. I know that there's those, and maybe even here, and I could get into that of the eschatology. What's that? That's a big fancy word for end of times. But there's many that think that we will not have any tribulations whatsoever, that we won't have any trials, and that they think that it's all just going to be good and we're going to have the best life now. That's not the case. We will endure tribulations. We have troubles. Look around. Maybe we don't understand all the troubles and the tribulations that we have, but my friends, if you as a Christian in Ukraine, do you think that they're having some tribulation? I mean, just think about what we are dealing with and the difficulties and the hard times. There have been series over the course of life of tribulations, wars, and yes, rumors of wars. Well, moving on, because I, I, I could camp there for a long time, I do believe that we as Christians are not immune to it, for we are like the wheat and the tares. We grow up together, but there will be a harvest time. And that time will be when the Lord will take out his bride and take out his church and that we will indeed go on to be with him and the chafe will be burnt. There will be a day. There will be a time. When will that be? I don't know. How's that? I don't know. Because if you did, you'd live your life the way you want to instead of the way he wants to until that time frame comes. Well, Paul and Barnabas, they, they go on and as they... They had ordained elders in the church. Paul and Barnabas were committed to making new Christians. They go back and they realize that, hey, these young Christians are going to have a hard time. We need to go back and strengthen them. We need to go back and encourage them. In fact, they need a better foundation. So you know what they do? They begin to um, make elders in the church. You say, well, the church wasn't very old. They went and they started and they started planting churches. How in the world did they, how long did they have to be put aside or set aside and so forth? I mean, you know what? They were just there a couple weeks ago. How long have you been a Christian? Two weeks. How long have you been a Christian? Three weeks. Well, I, who do I go with? I need to make an elder. You've been here two weeks. You've been here three weeks. I guess I'm going to have to go with Mr. Three-Week Guy. That's not the case. And let me share this with you all as well. I've seen this happen, and I know you have too. Just because someone has been a Christian for three years 
does not mean that they have grown in their spiritual maturity as much as someone who has been in it for three months. You say, huh? Let me share with you, and I have seen this firsthand over 20 years of ministry. The one that gets saved, I'm not talking about salvation, I'm talking about growth, that comes to church twice a month. And the one that gets saved, and they come to church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday nights, and they're in a Bible study, who is really growing and understanding in the Word of God? That's what we must gauge, and you must look at what the Holy Spirit is doing within them and the work and the ministry that's going on in their life to gauge spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. I believe that Paul and Barnabas, as they go back, they knew that they were going to be leaving and moving. That's what evangelists do. They can come in, blow in, blow up, and blow out. But they wanted to make sure that the roots was going to take place. So they said, in order for this to happen, we need to be teachers of those folks. We're going to teach you how to do this ministry because we're leaving, but you've got to carry this ministry on. And I think about this with my friend, Dr. Brown. Who can replace Dr. Brown? I mean, really, who can replace a Dr. Brown? In my eyes, maybe not your eyes. It will take every one of us. And that's what it should be. You pour into others, and then it just phone trees out. Y'all remember the phone trees, this guy who's ever at the top and trickles out, trickles out, trickles out. You just pour it out to others, and therefore you go and do the ministry. One ripple making an impact throughout all the body of water. You just got to go and just got to keep preaching and teaching and proclaiming the good news and setting up and establishing others. I don't know what he saw in me. I really don't. I really don't. For eight years, he calls me every week. Here lately, it's been about every two weeks. What are you working on? What's going on? He took time and he invested into me. I'm glad he did, and he loved Oklahoma. I want you to know that. What's going on out there? And don't take this as a derogatory statement, and it doesn't mean big church, little church. Don't look at it like that, and he didn't mean it that way. But whenever he come out here, he loved it in the reception that he would receive. And he said, I just see a little Oak Hill. Now, keep that in his mindset because he was there 30 years. And I'm going to tell you what, no matter what he may have told you, I know what he told me. It was not all easy. And there's tons of scars, tons of things that he had. But what a joy it is to be able to see what the work of your ministry and how it's fruitful and how things have happened. And he's still invested in the guys like me. And I, I wasn't the only preacher he talked to. He talked to many, just investing and pouring into us. Why? Because after we're gone, we've got to make sure that the church is going to continue. So that's what Paul and Barnabas wanted to do on this missionary trip. Look, we don't want to just come in, blow in, blow up, blow out. We're going to go back through... And we're going to go back into the towns and we're going to set up and say, hey, I know there wasn't but a handful that got saved, but God cares about that handful. And a handful can make two hands. And, and we can keep going and we can keep expanding and we can keep going and keep moving and going on and going on and going on. I just think about that and that whole missionary trip and that whole missionary mindset. Well, commentators have pointed out the thought that how dangerously and idealistic, idealistically it is for us to appoint people too quick, but... Friends, I'm going to tell you what, and hear me. I say this in the utmost love. If you don't give people a job to do in the church, they'll go somewhere where they can get involved in another church. We are family, and you've got to give them a seat at the table. If you're serving in a ministry, let me ask you this. Who are you training to take your spot and help in your spot? Well, I ain't giving up mine. I've done this forever. No, are you teaching somebody? Are you helping somebody to be able to be encouragers and move on? That's a really the way that it should be. And we should never be a place that it's hard to get in to serve. You say, does that really happen? Absolutely. You go to some places and they'll be, I can't break through. I can't even get in. They won't let me do nothing. Ask. Get them involved. Well, moving on. And they prayed and they fasted, and Paul and Barnabas, with great concern, they, they, they reached out, they, they prayed and they sought the Lord's help. 
and they, they, command, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. I, I love this because even in all my messages and everything, it's verses like these that, well, let me just backtrack over here. And I'm trying to get used to my new Bible, so forgive me. Um, and when they had ordained them elders, I'm in verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. What does it mean that they commended them unto the Lord? Listen, we can do everything we can do. I can do all, I, I'd love to pour my whole library into you all, but it's ultimately, I commend you unto the Lord. It's up between you and the Lord. And he just said, look, I've done my best to help plant this church. I've done my best to do this ministry. But whether it's a success or not, it's up to them and the Lord. You do the best you can. But you can't take all the responsibilities for those that made it or those that did not. And sometimes it breaks my heart when we hear of those that have fall, fallen. But we just turn them over to the Lord. And we just have to say, there, I did, my, I did the best I could. Well, looking on, verses 27, 28 tonight. Well, let me, I may be getting ahead. I forgot 24 through 26. 24 through 26 says, And after they had passed through Poseidon, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Attilia, and thence sailed to Antioch, from which they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. It's very important if you go on a mission trip that you get to come back from the mission trip. It's part of the plan. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. This is a beautiful picture. Beautiful, beautiful picture. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice what they did. They left Antioch, went over here and sailed down to the Isle of Cyprus, and then they went up from Cyprus up to here. Then they made it in reverse order. But only on the way back home, they didn't go back to the Isle of Cyprus. They made that turn and just sailed all the way back to Antioch. For whatever reason, they didn't feel led to go back to Cyprus at this time frame. And they moved on. And as they did, they arrived back at Antioch, the place which they were sent out. This is something, and if we're recording, this is fine. I'm Kentucky Baptist, I'm Southern Baptist, but I wish that we would have more missionaries come back in and tell about the adventures to which we help finance and help support and have them come in and share with us about the adventures of what happened and took place. Listen, we can say we can support missions, but do you know the name of the mission, the person that you encountered on that trip? Do you have the face? You can't comprehend the smell. You can't comprehend the taste and, and the people and so forth. It's important to come back and give that mission report. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But it's their testimony to tell. And you say, well, what kind of testimony did they have to tell? I'm glad you asked. They say this trip was with great success. What grades success of a mission project? Often what we'll have is we grade success of a mission trip by... What's the number one way how we grade whether it was a successful mission trip or not? By the number, I hear it. Oh, how many people got saved on that mission trip? Well, I know last year we had ten, but we only had five this time. Does that mean that it wasn't a successful trip compared to the first trip? Absolutely not. VBS, we got VBS coming up. Get involved. See Deb, see Mel. There's plenty of places to serve. And you want to work? This is a church that's going to let you work. Get involved. Wouldn't it be something if we had one adult per every child? I better move on. What is success? Often, I will come back to that. VBS, often we say, was it a good VBS? Well, how many kids got saved at your church? Oh, we had 18 get saved at our VBS this year. You know what? We had 10 kids come to our VBS the whole time. Maybe they didn't get saved, but we had 10 kids show up. Was it a success? Listen, in ministry, there's planting. Sowing, rather. There's, there's, harvest, there's, there's weeding. There's, there's watering. Any farmer in the agricultural world, you are playing a part in the whole picture. 
And maybe they came to RVBS, but maybe they went and made the profession of faith at another church. It's for God. It's not for us in our name. It's for His name. But there's difficulties. Listen, VBS is going to be tough. You're going to do something for ministry, expect temptations, expect it to be difficult. Well, what kind? Listen, the travel itself was difficult. I'll guarantee you this, the first day of mission trip, not everything goes right. First day of VBS, not everything goes right. There's, there's difficulty in the travel itself. There's, there was the confrontation with Elymas on Cyprus. Remember the, the false prophet? Sometimes there's confrontation. The quitting of John Mark, to which we really don't know why he left. Being, uh, listen, in ministry, it hurts when somebody leaves. It does. It, 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 we take it personal, but I have to put them in the hands of the Lord. Being driven out of the cities of Antioch and Iconium. The temptation to receive adoration. Oh, let us be adorned as gods. The being stoned in Lystria. And yet Paul and Barnabas would not be deterred from doing the work of God. And it shouldn't shock us because um, when we're out to do the work of the Lord, we've we got to keep our eyes on Him. And know why we're doing it. Paul goes on to say in Philippians 3, 12, and 14, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if it that I may apprehend it, that which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to say that the disciples stayed in Antioch, their hometown. They stayed there for a little while. What a beautiful picture. Maybe they stayed there. Maybe they got refreshed. Maybe they got encouraged. But they had the whole church come out and they got to share their testimony. I think it's important that we rehearse what God's done and we don't get in too big of a hurry and just move on to the next thing. You've got to look in the rearview mirror every once in a while. But you do got to look out the windshield the majority of the time. But you've got to look back and just see what God just did. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. I want to ask for a hymn of invitation tonight. Do you have a hymn of invitation this evening?